Hey everyone, my name is Tegan and this is the first video about writing that I've done in a long time. So recently I've been editing my first book. This is the it is this book right here. It's not actually this version, it's the um the original like skinny version. That's about 50 pages shorter. And I decided that I started writing this book in 2014 when I was 13 years old and I decided that it's been enough years now that I should probably go back to it and fix the typo that's on the very first page and I did not notice until now and um, when I was going through this book I like looked at it in ebook version and I spent a lot of time just looking at all these little quotes in it and thinking you know it's been uh, seven years since I started writing it I was 13 then I'm 20 now <laughs> I just thought I'd make a little video just going over some of my favourite bits. So I have four little sticky notes marking specific chapters and where's some good pages. I have a couple highlights and some annotations about things I specifically want to talk about. And I thought it was interesting about this book that I know a lot of people write things and put them away and sometimes don't go back to old drafts or old stories. But I have attachment issues to everything I've ever written. So I have been dragging this draft through the years with me since 2014 and I've been doing the same for all of my other drafts and I will not let go of them until they are done. So yeah, today we're going to be talking about Beauty and the Breakdown, my first book that I started writing um, October 23rd, 2014 and it was published, it was self-published February the 20th, 2017. So let's begin. The first thing I've highlighted in this book is on page 17, which is one of my lucky numbers. I like 7s, 27s, 37s, 17s, 3s, 21s. That was a 2. <laughs> but it's on this page and I've done a green highlight. These are all things that if you go onto my Goodreads account and read my Kindle highlights and annotations, you should be able to see these things up there. But we're going to go for it now. So this is the quote that says, I reach across the gap between us and cup her face with my hands, running my thumbs across the faint constellations of freckles spattered on her skin. And it's it, it's been seven years since I started writing this, and I still compare like freckles on your skin to stars in the sky in almost everything I write. I really love the celestial imagery. Celestial Im I love celestial imagery, and I also love bringing in like song lyric references. That one I think was inspired by Dodie's little song which she wrote based off comments from fans called Freckles and Constellations. And if it wasn't inspired by that little phrase, it is now. But yeah, I love including this kind of imagery and I love writing about song lyrics because they are beautiful and poetry and written. <laughs> and that's just something that's very meaningful to me. They're things that define my personality and this book is just an embodiment of everything I was and loved at 13. And yeah, the freckles and constellations simile metaphor comes into, as I said, almost every single thing I've ever written. And I just love freckles. <laughs> it's times like this when it feels as if everything has gone from zero to 100 miles per hour in an instant before crashing into a wall and exploding. You jump into a situation headfirst without knowing what's going to happen and it ends up awful. You feel as if you will shatter at the slightest touch, about to crumble into dust if another situation becomes too ridiculous, too desperate. This, I'm pretty sure, is a Taylor Swift reference. It's been a few years now, so let me remember. I think in the music video for I Knew You Were Trouble, first of all, that music video, the aesthetic of it, I love it, it's one of my favourite Taylor, vid Taylor videos, and the aesthetic of that was very inspiring to this book. But also, at the start of the video, there's this very long, almost monologue, which I drew a lot of inspiration from. And it's about these zero to a hundred relationships that are every shade of red, good or bad. And that is something that really stuck out to me when I was a little 13 year old. <laughs> then we have the quote, which is the first instance of the book title in this book. There are two, there's one in the very first chapter and there's one in the very final chapter. <laughs> but they are slightly different. This one is, we repeat our trail of falling apart but not quite falling back together, or the dust of something settling but remained to be just dust. Eventually we found that there was something quite beautiful in the way that things broke down. And I'm obsessed with writing about beauty, especially unconventional kinds of beauty. Again, in everything I've written. 
Next up we have an entire, almost an entire chapter marked. It starts off here on page 35. And where does this go? It's, okay, it's about a five page section. Um, this scene, chapter, this little conversation that I'm going to read a little bit to you was inspired by a Tumblr post of a similar theme. It's about how you define love. And there's also a post that used to be on Halsey's old Tumblr, I'm pretty sure, which is where someone asked her how would you describe love in every sense. Do you believe in love? She asked suddenly, running her fingers through the water. The pool lights cast a swirling purple pattern across her face, giving her a supernatural glow. So just the, how do you, like, do you, what was, <laughs> I forgot my quote. Do you believe in love was the thing that's triggered this entire chapter. And this is probably one of the favourite things that I've ever written, so congratulations, 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 13 year old me. And yeah, it goes through a paragraph for each sense of how the main character Josh defines love and it's alternated with how this other character Clara is going through like basically research of what she's read about love because that's her only experience and it's like the difference between loving someone and being in love with them and all the chemicals and all the science and the psychology behind love contrasted with these very personal paragraphs of what's not really describing being in love but just love my two favourite ones from this specific chapter, it repeats later on in the book with a kind of fresh perspective on love from a 13 year old. But my favourite ones are the touch and the sound ones, so I'll give those a little read to you. I'll also try and put them on the screen somewhere. To me, love feels like fingers joining every constellation of freckles, every blemish, every scar on your skin and creating something beautiful. It feels like the draining blood of exhaustion from late night calls that linger until you finally see them in the flesh for the first time in weeks. It feels like a comfortable silence beneath clean sheets when a single touch speaks more than your mouth can. And then, to me love sounds like the low hum of the engine and an 80s ballad crooning out of a static stereo, gravel crunching beneath the tyres. It sounds like murmured words at three in the morning that would usually be left unspoken, brought out by the milky tiredness and gentle giggles. It sounds like the soft singing disguised by the pour of the shower and the grunt in the third when a shampoo bottle slips out of soapy hands. And it's just these very simple things of what, or just things I loved at 13. And I love that this book truly encapsulates who I was back then and there's this little, little archive of little me. So, do you believe in love? I sigh as I contemplate my answer. I won't ever admit it to anyone, but that's what I think love is. It's more than a feeling. It's something out of my reach. I don't think so. So this was originally meant to be a romance between these two people right here. <laughs> and um, trying to write a love story while also trying to avoid writing romance was probably the first time that I am a sec like the first time, the first sign that I am asexual and aromantic <laughs> and I didn't notice at the time because I, I was very against romance and stories I thought I was like an edgy little preteen but no I just wanted something that represented me so I kind of wrote it and I'm not going to read this one quote to you but it is just this I'm sure, here it's this big paragraph basically just describing a dandelion sticking out crack in the pavement and I used to be someone who over-described everything when I was writing, not to set a scene, but because I was very much an underwriter and I needed the word count somehow. And I made that in descriptions rather than subplots. <laughs> so this specific paragraph is a lot of words describing a dandelion and not a lot of words describing anything else. But I think it comes, this scene comes after a moment of very extreme trauma. So fixating on this tiny and significant detail felt very realistic to me because it's how I cope like something bad happens and I focus on just one thing to ground me I guess and looking back at this chapter now that I see that that makes sense to me but at the time I was definitely just trying to get my word count up <laughs> then also this is on page 118 119 there's a lot of things here just existential crises more pretentious John Green inspired stuff 
that I look back now and I was just thinking like, wow, was I okay when I was a child? Okay, page 127. Main character Josh is having a conversation about if he is in love with Clara, the main girl, because they have a very close relationship. They've been running away together for months and it's just like, are, are you in love with her? Because she's probably in love with you. <laughs> so, I don't think I'm in love with her, but I don't think I've experienced the feeling enough to find a comparison. I believe that people fall in love with who with someone who they match and how can that happen when one of us is a river running next to an ocean that was definitely inspired by john's green i was Driz when she was a hurricane but it is very interesting reading in this now and seeing my perspective on love and then finding out that i do not experience romantic attraction <laughs> and there's a quote on the following page that says we sit in the silence that follows for a while. The sounds of the wind and the world are still carrying on outside. And I have this odd feeling in my chest that everything might somehow work out in the end. And when I was going back through this book, I spent a lot of time to myself criticizing how I used to write. Because I guess one, a lot of it could have been unorig unoriginal. Cause I picked and stole from a, mostly a lot of like Tumblr posts, which isn't as bad as like pulling scenes from books directly. I was very inspired by other people's perspective of the world because I was young and had no world experience and I was trying to write about people who do. So I was very critical of how unoriginal some of my work felt and how pretentious some of it felt. But that one chapter there, not chapter, that one little line is just a line that I genuinely adore because the simplicity of it and how much I see my authentic self in that line. And we have a little, we've got a little green post-it note here. This is on page 143. It is the chapter titled Tuesday, 18th of November. The opening line is my hunger, my hunger, oh my God, I talk today. The opening line is my hunger pains return on the first day it rains in weeks. And this intro scene to this chapter was a later addition to this book. I am, um, so that was probably more 14 rather than 13 were writing this and it's just a moment of reflection on just a guy looking in the mirror and just realizing how much he's changed since he ran away and not for the better and this is a scene that kind of dabbles with suicidal thoughts and again looking back on it i wonder was it okay as a child and there's just where we're looking we're looking over here it's literally just a line that says can you you can't quite see this top one. It just says, I wonder if this is what it's like to feel alive. And then I look up and the clouds make the sky look white and bright, like tiny star-like chicken pot scars scattered across my skin, which brings back the celestial star constellation imagery. This entire chapter, I have very vivid memories, maybe not of writing it the first time, but reading through the full thing the first time and identifying with it because it starts off with a, the character looking in the mirror and basically realizing that oh yeah he's slowly basically starving to death and he goes upon the roof in the rain and he stands right on the edge of the roof and it's a kind of moment where it was like oh he's about to jump off the roof but it's a sense of peace of just having your life slightly out of your control and leaving it up to nature to decide and just the rain and the atmosphere so it's a scene that is equal parts stressful and full of tension, but there's this very slight beauty and calmness in this storm. And then that scene ends by saying, eventually I talk myself down from the edge. I decide that it's all right for me to be afraid. And I wrote these lines six or seven years ago, but it's only more recently that it started to hit close to home. I've also put another sticky note later on in the chapter which is probably which is it is the newest edition to this book this scene i added in while doing this edit which is why it is longer than the original little version and it's a very simple flashback scene because i wanted a moment of just pure goodness and a moment of light throughout this very dark story so it's just a flashback scene 
of the last good day these two people had together. Also it opens with the line, that night I have to remind myself to breathe in, out, in, out. I can't focus on anything else or I really might just stop breathing. Which is another very simple thing that stands out to me. So I marked this part of the chapter because it's just something that I genuinely love. And it's a very clearly a moment of my own experience and my own life, just Americanized to fit with this book. And there's this little conversation of Josh telling Clara that she's his favorite. And him just saying, why? And he just, he just says, I'm not quite sure why yet, but you are my favorite, I'll let you know. And it is this very sweet moment. And it ends with saying, we were free, we were beautiful, we were unbroken. And that is also another theme that I carry out in my more recent works. Okay, I marked these three post-it notes very close together. So we have another scene that dabbles with suicidal thoughts, it seems. And I marked these as favourite scenes probably because they are so personal to me. Even though it's about a fictional character, there's a lot of my own experience in there. And a lot of very... I've already said personal things, but a lot of this book is like a scrapbook of my own memories and my own experience. Another very simple line that I really like just says, up here I watch the same sun rise and set over a different horizon. But yeah, this bit of the chapter is just two characters talking about dying, why Josh spends so much time up on the roof, and it is a moment of talking about guns, but yeah. I don't feel strongly about most things in my life, but I hate guns. I hate the noise, I hate the mess. I hate triggers and bullets and how final everything is. Guns scare me, there's nothing particularly beautiful about them. So yeah, it's another continuation of this guy being obsessed with, some, with finding some kind of beauty in the breakdown. <laughs> and I know there's a quote here, which I think, wow, I w is another thing of, was I really that sad when I was 13? It says, I can romanticise the sense of hell that I found inside myself as much as I want because if I'm going to eventually go ahead and destroy myself, I might as well make it worth the while. And if I'm going to find a way to drain the blood from my body, I might as well paint it into a pretty picture. Which is like, yeah, that's, that's a raw line, but was I okay? Another little line I like, out of context, is it's like seeing Clara all over again, a black and white girl now in full colour, which is quite nice ignoring the context of that line. I'm not going to tell you the context of that line. But yeah, my raw quotes kind of die out um, in the later half of the book, because it's where things start getting into more intense and dramatic, rather than like poetic and beautiful, and all, in some ways it did romanticise mental health, because I was on Tumblr far too young, in like the 2013-14 era, when it was very toxic, it was very much glamorising depression and things like that. And I was very blinded by that, I was like, wow, me being sad, it can be beautiful. And that is a, a summary of this book. So yes, there are trigger warnings, I will leave a list of the trigger warnings for this book in the description, but also in Goodreads, there is one of the reviews has the trigger warnings. Because there's a website which I'm pretty sure is just called booktriggerwarnings.com which is almost like a wikipedia for you can upload books and the trigger warnings and it puts on goodreads so th there's a thing to let you know about josh isn't proud of who he is maybe that's why he is always running he is too afraid to fall in love and i'm afraid because i've fallen that's very sweet and sad <laughs> in the page 272 which is my birthday by the way the 27th of the second it's the return of describing love as a breakdown of the different senses. And this is a big, it's trying to make like, you know, the big cyclical circle structure. Was to remind you of that earlier scene that was almost very pure and innocent talking about love. And this is reflecting on the hundreds of pages in between of sad. So. To me, love smells like the aroma of paper and old leather as you step into a used bookstore. It smells like weekend morning walks that you've forgotten everything about but the scent of the jacket against your skin. It smells like a familiar perfume embedded deep into the sheets when you wake up and they're not beside you. And these ones are slightly more romantic lovey rather than platonic lovey. 
I like this one a lot. To me, love feels like hearts shaking in fragile rib cages, ready to burst out when two loves meet. It feels like tangled hair brushing against your hands when they collapse into your lap from exhaustion. It feels like a hand that fits into your own as if they were crafted to be that way, the skin too cold and yours too warm. I realise a lot of my things about love are falling asleep together, being tired and like body spitting together. Because it's really nice how human beings were made and they're just meant to hold each other, you know? There's a big Tumblr quote about that. But it's nice how nicely people fit together. To me, love looks like a saturated sunrise when the world is still quiet and revolving around you. It looks like the delicate spiderweb of veins trapped beneath your skin, creating patterns of blue and purple. It looks like a face contorted by laughter with crinkled eyes and a carefree grin. So saturated sunrise is definitely taken from Halsey's song colours. <laughs> and yeah, I, I love that line so much. And after this little chapter is the final confession. So if you remember, the first one was about believing in love and this one is finally confessing that he is not in love with this person but he does love her, which is a very important um, difference that I tried to clarify throughout this book, of the difference between loving someone and being in love with them. And I think a nice quote to end this on would be, this isn't a love story, it's a story of trust through the eyes of someone who refuses to do so. It's a story of discovering things about yourself that no one else could possibly know. It's a story about finding melody in, cacoph in cacophony finding a sequence of notes amongst a battleground of noise. And as much as I wanted this to be a romance, it is not that, but it is definitely a love story. I hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you next time. Bye.